-hmm. And then you could potentially bypass uh, some of the national structures at the state level by starting to connect some of these regional and urban municipal movements together at a European level. Oh. And I think that's where it could potentially get very interesting. I mean, but, we, uh, today we had a couple of whistleblowers inside and Ixnet. Mm -hmm. That's a radical Spanish yeah. uh, platform. So let's agree on we stay optimistic about it. And let's right. see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Jerome Ross, the editor of Rover magazine. And I'm here with <laughs> Katerina Anastasiu. <laughs> She's uh, very active as a, an activist as a, at the transnational European level with Change for All, among others, and Transform Europe. Change for All tries to map sort of these struggles going on across the continent. And we're here to talk about DiEM and why we're here. So why are you here? <laughs> well, I'm here because um, I saw the manifesto, the mm -hmm. DiEM manifesto. Um, I was intrigued by it because I obviously think that something needs to happen at the European level. The European space remains a crucial space for organizing and it's perhaps not organized enough within. Um, and at the same time I also saw that some of the people in attendance um, are from movements and organizations and platforms that I have enormous respect for, including uh, some of the municipal platforms in Spain. Uh, so I came here basically to learn about how these different organizations and movements want to relate to each other and what can come out of this common project, if anything. Yeah, more or less the same here. Mm -hmm. um, it got me curious, mm -hmm. first of all. I mean, since July, the, the, the transnational level seemed to deem a little bit. So um, I consider every try to, to somehow combine the struggles uh, very useful. I was here before, anyway, for the Blockify mm -hmm. meeting. So after uh, the response of Yanis Varoufakis in this open letter, I was very intrigued to see how he wants to cope with that. I'm still not very clear. Um, how they uh, it tend to open up in a horizontal way, mm -hmm. but we're here to find out. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the feeling that I get from today's meeting is that um, they've managed so far to bring a lot of interesting people together, mm -hmm. uh, but to really turn this into a movement rather than a platform for brainstorming is going to take some kind of bridging towards mm -hmm. movements that are actually already organizing on the ground, that are already doing these things, because you cannot invent a movement at the drop of a hat. No. So what you need to do is you need to build upon structures that are already there, movements that are already there, struggles that are already existing. And in that respect, I think some of the most interesting participants are precisely those who are organizing within the urban terrain in Spain. Um, and movements like Blockupy. So maybe I can ask you a little bit about uh, how Blockupy, people within Blockupy relate to DM. if you have any idea about this, if you've discussed this within the meetings. Yeah, I mean, uh, I cannot speak for Blockupy, but there were a lot of discussions on, on the sides of the weekend. Um, the most, um, I'd say that the biggest question uh, or the most evident quest question amongst us was why, why are they calling this a movement and not mm -hmm. a campaign? Yeah? Because it was not uh, the way how it should transform, it should be an ongoing process. If usually, or um, the way we know it now, if you're not rooted on the ground, it's not a movement, no? Mm -hmm. So it was a, I'd say this would be the main critique. But on the other hand, uh, the try of um, like actually challenging uh, this fragmentation between national politics and the transnational level, and uh, also this um, kind of um, swing you feel within the left also, with some outcries and the return on national borders. Mm -hmm. What is happening in Europe right now with fences mm -hmm. jumping up all over the place? So um, these questions still are are open, but I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, there is a brainstorming session going on in there right mm -hmm. now where we have this interview, and I'm I'm very curious how um, this idea of uh, I don't know, joining voices horizontally in a transnational level can work. I mean, do you think the internet is enough? Uh, no, I don't think the internet is enough. Especially be if you consider who uses the internet to organize politically. It's mm -hmm. a fraction of society. It's, mm -hmm. let's say, a, a group of more professionally engaged activists, even if they're not getting paid for it. I mean, mm -hmm. basically are professional activists working on things full time. Um, those can make use of some of those tools, perhaps, uh, in order to connect with each other like some of us are already doing. Yeah. Uh, 
I think the challenge ultimately is to reach out to much broader constituencies and much broader uh, segments of society. Mm -hmm. So to really sort of generate some mass uh, behind an organization that can sustain itself at the European level. And that's ultimately the real trick, right? It's like, how do you create these organizations? And it's not, Diem is not the first to sort of ask these questions. So it would be very interesting to see how they will engage with those who are already doing this type of stuff mm -hmm. on the ground and to see what they will learn from these people. I mean, it's still intriguing for me because uh, Varvakis came also to Blockupy, to mm -hmm. introduce himself, let's say, uh, to, to the movements and the, or a traditional transnational strong movement. Um, and um, he said very loudly and very proudly he wishes for a movement without a central committee, mm -hmm. you know? Like uh, a critique to the bureaucracy that yeah. a lot of times and uh, we too will agree for sure is killing the potential uh, creativity within mm -hmm. such movements. Uh, but still, um, I mean, for example, the, the questions that say is open is how do you get the German worker, the Italian worker, the Greek worker sympathize with each other? And we had the discussion right now some minutes ago. Um, um, what do you think? Uh, is it actually? Is it all about uh, national politics? Is it uh, um, transnational politics? Uh, what's the difference? Why are we talking to different levels now here? Well, I think that part of it mm -hmm. comes out of this peculiar moment that we had last year mm -hmm. uh, with the Greek referendum and sort of the whole build-up and the standoff between Syriza and the European creditor powers um, that sort of forced uh, a lot of discussion onto the national domain, right? So it's mm -hmm. Germany against Greece. Um, and in these debates, the left has also become split. So there's part of the left um, that would want to go back to some kind of more nationally based politics. Mm -hmm. And there's a left that's more European oriented in its strategies. Um, and even that part, that European part, is now split effectively between those who stayed in power in Greece, mm -hmm. uh, Tsipras and uh, people who stayed loyal to him, and on the other hand, Varoufakis, who's trying to actually do something at the European level, um, but it hasn't stuck with uh, the Greek government, has actually left and, and, and started to do his own thing. But I think that, you know, when we're actually trying to think of all of this, it's sort of crucial to keep in mind what has happened over the past five years, which is that a European debt crisis, which was fundamentally a crisis, uh, a conflict between working people, um, especially in the South and in, in Ireland, so in the European periphery, and the banks of the North, has been transformed over the course of the crisis into a national conflict. And that's not just in terms of the discourse and the ideology behind it, but even in terms of the material factors of the crisis. In the sense that the debt of Greece um, five years ago was 80% in the hands of private banks in Northern Europe. Today, it's 80% in the hands of the taxpayers of the other European countries. It's mm. public debt now. So what would happen if Greece had defaulted uh, last summer um, the people who would have gotten kind of screwed, technically, would have been taxpayers in the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. So what the European elites managed to do is really turn a class struggle into a national struggle. And it's just going to be very difficult to actually break out of that, because that's now sort of encoded into the material constitution of the Eurozone, this, this rivalry between these countries. So in that respect, I think DiEM is very important, because we need to articulate some kind of European discourse, some kind of um, critique mm -hmm. of the way the Eurozone crisis has been managed, that has actually pitched countries against each other, Whereas the fundamental source of the crisis was a, f a fundamental conflict between finance capital and the vast majority of the population, not just in Greece, but in Germany and all the other countries. Mm -hmm. So we need to somehow go return. We need to take a step back and sort of return to that fundamental conflict and try to analyze how we can um, sort of clarify this, this, this fundamental conflict and, and bring that home to people. I agree with you, um, but I have, an, I have another skepsis. And my problem is, um, I mean, analysis for sure, but how, how do you deliver to the worker? I mean, we've been, we, we too have met in many different venues where left intellectuals meet and activists and we try to exchange, find the magical solution, this one idea, or create the momentum that will make us go forward like the referendum in the summer. But still, I mean, um, what uh, what gave let's say ground um, to all this um, misunderstandings? Uh, we'll try to be very polite. Uh, was a, almost a propaganda machine as we've experienced it from previous decades. I mean, I will never forget uh, Varoufakis himself in February last year mm -hmm. uh, saying in the in one of his interviews that Greece is striving for a bridging agreement. 
A day later, it was translated in German as Rüberbrückungshilfe, which means bridging loan. So all the German press was uh, like, like screaming, the Greeks want more money. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, or having Angela Merkel saying that uh, we're very, very solidarious to Greece because we give them money. And at the same time, um, NGOs like Attack publishing real-time research is saying that from the actual loans that Greece received, only 11% actually reached yep. the Greek state. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of uh, material we have to work with. And I think the big challenge is to be able to transfer the not, the, not another narrative, but the truth mm -hmm. to the workers and um, find a way to unite them behind the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth and a call for justice. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm totally supportive in this kind of try, but I, I still, I miss something. Well, it's going to be extremely difficult, especially in the European North, um, in the sense of like the core countries. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Netherlands and I've spoken to many people inside the Netherlands about the crisis and they know, they, they know that I've lived in Greece for a couple of years, and that I've studied this, uh, this crisis mm -hmm. for my own PhD. And so we talk about it a lot and obviously, obviously the question that comes up is the debt and should it be repaid or should there be more money or whatever. Mm -hmm. And invariably this is construed as a question of uh, guilt, uh, right? Because the word in German and in Dutch for debt is schuld or schuld, which literally means guilt as well as mm -hmm. debt. Um, so it instantly has this morally laden connotation which then gets reinscribed into this national notion, right? Like mm -hmm. some people behaved irresponsibly and this whole notion sort of forbids uh, uh, the idea of European solidarity to begin with. The very understanding of the crisis forbids this. So I, I do think that this analysis is very crucial, but we haven't succeeded clearly in the past five years in bringing that across in a successful way. And many people um, maybe even prefer not to hear this truth uh, because it fits, what they do believe fits with certain uh, preconceptions and it sits more easily with certain um, preconceptions about, you know, <laughs> Greeks and <laughs> Southern Europeans in general, or Irish people, uh, that are very difficult to shatter and break, even with you know a rational discussion and, and, and the notion of truth. Mm -hmm. So people also hear to an extent what they want to hear, and it's going to be very difficult to breach that. Uh, I don't have any answers to that. I don't yeah. know. No, I me mean, neither. But I, it, it's still, I mean, there are positive things happening. What, what I experienced myself the last month was uh, that due to the um, newcomers, um, the solidarity and, and the basis of the society grew immensely between the Balkan countries. And you, you had networks that were not there because the, the left is there very fragmented. Um, the governments are very neoliberal and it, it's not a new phenomenon there. I mean, it has been there at least in ex Yugoslavian countries since the end of the war, no? So um, still they managed to transnationalize the solidarity to the refugees and uh, connect the, the actual physical struggles for for a better a better world at the end of the day. So um, I'm 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 looking for the spaces all the time where where all, all these people can come together and discuss and act. But still, I don't. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I how how to reach out to the everyday society. I mean, it's pretty scary. I live in Austria, in the German-speaking speaking countries, there was, or actually Austria and Germany, um, I'll take Switzerland out of it, um, there, was, there were certain taboos that are not there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, two days ago, people were in a carnival with a car with an 8-8 on them. Um, there is, you see the workers uh, that are, that haven't seen any any improvement on the on or the, on their life, um, uh, material life, last ten years, uh, prefer to lynch refugees than to address the 64 people mm -hmm. owning as much as three billion. And this is my problem. I mean, the content is there. It's not something we have to invent. Mm -hmm. This injustice is out there, and. Um, what what do we miss? Do, do we miss a common transnational analysis? Is our ana analysis too national? Are we just patchworking national analysis with each other and say we have a transnational picture of what is going on? Is DiEM, uh, for example, a venue where we could work more on that, uh, looking at topics spherical and see how how do we work together also in the media and communication mm -hmm. level? I think this should be the first step. Without this and a, a content that 
can be transmitted in everyday people. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine how it would work another way. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that the trick fundamentally is to create some kind of bridge between uh, what we call the transnational level and what's actually very real for people in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely why, and I'm going to go back to something I've mentioned before, I'm so interested in, um, in the Spanish municipal platforms and this idea of spreading to some other European cities now, um, and to see how they will relate to this um, presentation of DiEM, mm -hmm. and um, if there's any way that uh, they will become involved. And if not, then I think that DiEM is just going to remain, and with all due respect, is just going to remain a group uh, of very interesting people with very interesting point of views and very um, uh, worthy ideals um, to democratize Europe. But if that struggle, if that platform, that movement, as they call it, is not going to be rooted in the everyday lives of ordinary people, it's not going to get anywhere. So the, I think right now one of the few movements that's actually managing to build power at a level where it can bring about some material benefits for ordinary people is uh, the Spanish municipal platforms. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And uh, of course they're running into tons of uh, difficulties in terms of uh, institutional practices that are just so deeply embedded within the bureaucracy of the municipality and the mm -hmm. state that sort of put enormous limits and constraints upon them. So I'm not going to idealize or romanticize it, uh, but I do think that there you're actually seeing some wager on the part of the movements to, um, to take a next step after years and years of street mobilizations and try to build some new political organizational forms and develop new democratic forms um, and at the same time actually you know, do that on a scale where you can actually bring about some kind of change. I have a yeah. this argument uh, yesterday in a talk was, um, and I think he's right, mm -hmm. um, he said um, in, in countries of the south where 60-40% of the people are unemployed, the labor, uh, the traditional uh, labor spaces, like the unions, are no longer um, the natural space of organization. So he, he takes this as an argument, and instead of the neighborhood, which is the case mm -hmm. uh, in Spain, for example, or in Italy, mm -hmm. um, he takes it to the internet and he says, OK, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to join transnationally in the internet. Mm -hmm. But it's still, there's still this limitation. So maybe the first step would be internet workshops uh, for older people in mm -hmm. small spaces or donating computers. I don't know. There is a hope for that for sure. But uh, yeah. yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the internet is definitely some tool. It's a tool that needs to be used, uh, but I am skeptical as to how much it can actually um, be a platform, uh, a real platform for democracy. And I, I really do believe that precisely because of what you mentioned, the demise of the trade unions, uh, the traditional labor movement, we need to organize new mass movements that are actually rooted in the everyday life of, of, of people. And um, since it's so difficult to organize in the working places, I would love for there to be more organization in the working place, but since it's so difficult to organize in the working places and to organize into unions, perhaps this kind of organization at the level of the city or at the level of the region uh, can offer an alternative. Mm -hmm. And then you could potentially bypass uh, some of the national structures at the state level by starting to connect some of these regional and urban municipal movements together at a European level. Yeah, okay. And I think that's where it could potentially get very interesting. I mean, but, we, uh, today we had a couple of whistleblowers inside and Ixnet. Mm -hmm. That's a radical Spanish uh, platform. So let's agree on we stay optimistic about it. Let's and let's try. see what happens, yeah. <laughs>